Hebrews chapter 5 this evening. Uh, everybody get your Bibles open this evening. I want you to give me attention tonight. I'm going to be a little bit longer than normal. That's why I went, let the kids go ahead, and I'm, I'm not going to preach. I'm going to talk about a, a topic and a subject that we all need to, to uh, get this evening. Hebrews chapter 5, look at verse number 13. Hebrews 5, 13. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age. Even those, here's what I want to look at tonight, who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. That verse says your senses need to be exercised. Like somebody lifting weights bodily exercise, your senses, so that you might discern good and evil. How do you know what's of God, what's not of God? What's right, what is wrong? Especially sometimes when the Bible doesn't mention something or not clear on something. That's what I want to talk about tonight. I'm going to talk about tonight revival, uh, uh, Burlington especially, and other uh, places. Now, uh, it really started bothering me a couple of months ago when I started getting phone calls and texts from people in different states asking me about the Burlington revival that was going on a few uh, back in the summer. And um, at that time, I just heard about it, and I finally did get to go and enjoyed it very much, and praise God for what he did. Um, but... I ask people asking me, what do you think about this? Do you, is this a genuine move of God? Is this a, so I'm going to talk about that, just revivals in general tonight. Um, there's a lot of critics of revival. While a lot of critics are writing letters and saying things and saying that that revival and other revivals that we might see is all emotionalism, that it's all hype, that it's all singing and not much preaching, you know, you get a lot of bread but no meat. There's a lot of flesh, no substance to it. And uh, uh, a lot of pressure techniques, uh, high-powered evangelism, stuff like that, against using anything, any humor, any illustrations, or any one certain style of preaching. Now, me personally, God has somehow had mercy on me and blessed me that I've got to see a part of at least five and maybe seven at least sparks of fire of real revival. The revival that I got saved in was a revival. And I'm telling you, it went. the services went two weeks, but that revival went for about two years. And it changed the community. The community was different. I mean, people's lives were different. They... they they changed their lives. We people got together and burned, had burnings, and burned their rock music, and burned their CDs. And well, they didn't have CDs then, but burned whatever they listened to. Their their and burned books and magazines. Anything that was wrong had burned. And I've seen that in several of. Them. That's what they did in the Book of Acts. They burned their books. Uh, I mean, real revival produces stuff like that. A real revival, buddy, will put you under conviction of sin. I'm telling you, it'll tear you up, and you ain't going to be the same in two or three days. I'm still going, and that was a long time ago, brother. I'm still, uh, and I've never got over what God did for me. Now, in that revival that I got saved in at Nebo, it received a lot of criticism. There were preachers preached against it. There were pe preachers told their uh, people, don't go down there. Don't go to that church. It's just a bunch of young people. It's just a bunch of emotionalism. It's not real. They'll take anything in. People coming in there dressed all kinds of ways, hippies, uh, you know, drug addicts. And, and that's, that was the truth. But I'm telling you, anytime there's a genuine move of God, uh, you're going to get stuff like that. Uh, I've seen revival break out twice at youth camp, one in 1986 and one in 1994. We won't take time to go into all those, but those were tremendous moves of God. There are people in the ministry and serving God today as a result of those uh, revivals that broke out then. 
Then they're over in, Revi in Robbinsville, North Carolina. I uh, had that revival. Went 17 nights. Went on parts of three weeks. I kept going back. We had over 75 people saved. It got in the school. school kids were talking to their, their parents and, uh, and the school teachers. It, it just got good. I mean to tell you, it was good. And there again, a lot of the local preachers criticized it. Uh, then in Alabama, several years ago, down at Brother Brandon Bruce's, it broke out. It just broke out. And it, they, they wanted to go to church seven nights a week. And God moved. We had, uh, I think he said, 80 saved. He baptized 30-something almost all in one day uh, at a baptism. And this was 300 people at night at a church about half this size and sitting in the aisles, and the choir would be full and down the aisles. We had them in there at 1.30 in the morning. No famous singing group, no well-known singers, nothing planned. It wasn't even on a flyer. And at 1 o'clock in the morning, the church house was filled and people were crying in the altar getting right with God. Was there some emotionalism? Absolutely. Was there some hype? Absolutely. Was there some things that probably God was not in? You better believe they was. Uh, was. Did everybody in them meetings really get saved? I highly doubt it. But I'm telling you, you can't. Uh, nobody in the right mind would deny that God uh, done something. That community is different. I mean, when that's what real revival is. It's not just an emotional stir. It's not just bring a famous singing group in here and get a big crowd. It's more than that. It's a whole lot more. Now let's talk about revival a little bit. And, I'm a, and I want you to think about the criticisms of the Burlington Revival that went nearly 13 weeks that uh, Brother Townsend preached down there. Fine young preacher, done a great job preaching. He does a tremendous job preaching the Word of God. Tremendous, great preacher. God's blessed him and, and using him in a great way. Now how did this get started? We're getting a lot of criticism because... Uh, preachers up north and stuff, they think us southern Christians are all just emotions and we're just no, no depth to us, you know, and we just, you know, we're just a life and stock. You ever wondered how this part of the country got to be called the Bible Belt? Well, years ago, those preachers went up and down this country and we called them circuit riders. Circuit riding, and most of them back in the old days were either circuit riding Methodist preacher, the old time Methodist. They were not exactly right on their doctrine, but I'm telling you, they wasn't nothing like this Methodist crowd we got today. I'm telling you, buddy, they would, Lord have mercy. John Wesley, I mean, Sam Jones, I'll talk about him in a minute. You could sum up his sermons in basically two, two sentences. Cease to do evil, learn to do well. And they preached that all up and down these country and these mountains. They went from one town to another, preaching up in the Cumberland Valley, Tennessee, uh, uh, back in Kentucky and the backwoods of West Virginia, North and South Carolina, mountains of Georgia. And that's why there's a Baptist church on every corner in this part of the country. And people grow up quoting Bible that have never even read it. Now, that started out with revival. I'll tell you a couple of them right quick. Peter Cartwright. Peter Cartwright, big old, tall, dark-headed fella. Great, great, great uh, circuit-riding preacher. And Peter Cartwright is the one that, uh, where we got a lot of our characteristics of American Christianity. That means like uh, stuff that we do, uh, that, you know, like, like the, uh, the invitation, the mourner's bench, which now we would call our altar. The old churches call that a mourner's bench. And the mourners would come and sit or kneel and just mourn over their sins. We even get criticized for that. I, years ago, somebody said, well, that ain't in the Bible. Just... Maybe, maybe you need to listen for a little bit before you, before you spout off like that about uh, uh, something you don't know nothing about. We got our mourner's bench. We got our invitation. We got the prayer room. We got all these, these characteristics of how we have revival services now from the old circuit riding preachers. Now, you remember this tonight, folks. You can be as straight as a gun barrel doctrinally and as empty as one spiritually. And there's a lot of folks like that. The Lord said, They that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. I've been places where they've got a lot of spirit and no truth. That's a crazy church. And then I've been to churches where they've got all the truth 
and no spirit. That's a dead church. And so you got, you got to have them both. If they worship God, must worship Him in spirit and in truth. Can't worship God without His spirit. Can't worship God without His truth. Now, old Peter Cartwright, he was the one that, I mean, it was rough. These people, we don't even understand the life that they live compared to the life we live. I mean, they'd knock them down. Somebody get in a fight, bam. Knock. I mean, he hit a guy one time. Guy was causing trouble. I mean, get him down. Dost thou not feel the spirit striving with thee? Like that. I mean, it was rough. And I mean, I know their doctrine wasn't all exactly right. But I'll tell you something, buddy. Old Peter Cartwright went to a, out, in a, out in the field one night, and it was pouring the rain. And he couldn't get out of the rain, just a flooding on his hat, on his horse, everything soaked, you couldn't even see. And he went in a barn, and there's having a dance in that barn. And, and, he, went in that, and he went in there that night, that old uh, tall, dark-haired preacher, and he said a young lady, a little, little sort of a loose young lady in the community grabbed, uh, come up to him and said, uh, would you like to dance, sir? And he said, thank you, ma'am, be glad to. And old Peter Cartwright stepped up there, and he said he grabbed that girl by the hand like that. Big old hand got a hold of her. She couldn't have got loose if she had wanted to. And he grabbed her hand and he said, young lady, I never do anything without asking God to bless it first. Let's pray. And buddy, he kneeled down, and they didn't pray like this modern day, our heavenly Father. I mean, he was, oh God! Oh God! And I mean, cut loose. She had heard jerking, and people running out, going out the, out the back door and everything else. And buddy had revival in that place. Fourteen people got saved that night. They turned that place and started church in there. That's the kind of people I'm talking about. That's where with this old time revival, camp meeting, tent revival stuff come from, men in days like that. Uh, I ain't got time to talk about uh, Gypsy Smith and C.T. Studd and, and Finney and, and Spurgeon and Moody. Lord have mercy. D.L. Moody talks so fast, didn't even have an education. He talks so fast it took two shorthand writers to take down what he said. That old boy never did get a formal education and robbed hell of a million souls. Uh, uh, Billy Sunday. Billy Sunday. You know what Billy Sunday did? Listen now. Billy Sunday said uh, he, he's a, a professional baseball player. And Billy Sunday had the world record of running the bases, running his bare feet. You couldn't even do that nowadays. wouldn't let you. But he held the record of running the bases. And Billy Sunday run those bases. He got saved. He started preaching. And, brother, you talk about emotion. We get criticized like these people in the South, just all emotion. Now, if all you got is emotion, you ain't got nothing. But if you don't, listen, it don't get no more dramatic than heaven and hell and eternal issues. Brother, if you can't get emotional over that, there's something wrong with you. Billy Sunday broke chairs, run back and forth, jumped on the platform, the pulpit, wound up taking his shirt, drew his shirt, uh, uh, britches leg rolled up, preaching his undershirt. And he said, I want to make America so dry, you'd have to prime a man to spit. What do you think these guys would say about Billy Sunday now? Was he just all emotionalism? They say, do you know what they're saying? They're saying a preacher should never use humor. Sam Jones was a great preacher. He is another one of them guys. Sam Jones is where the, a lot of the uh, uh, preacher humor come from. He's the one that originated the little quip about they send a young man off to cemetery, you know, not seminary. You know, every preacher's ever been said that. And that's where it come from, Sam Jones. He's the one that said, uh, started that thing about, uh, well, somebody hit him one time like that, and he said, did you turn the other cheek? And he said, yeah, but after that, the Lord didn't tell me what I had to do. And he didn't say, besides, I have to take care of Mrs. Jones' husband. I mean, just stuff like that. I mean, he had a tremendous sense of humor, and God used it in his own. Now, let me stop right here and say something. If a man has a natural sense of humor and God uses it to work through and in his life to reach people, that's great and wonderful. If all a man does is just get up and try to be funny, he ought to just sit down and shut up and try to get the power of God on his life. Amen. See what I'm saying? Yeah. All right, we'll get more of that in just a minute. Old, old Sam Jones, buddy, well, listen, when them guys had a meeting, when them guys had a meeting, they closed the liquor stores. The liquor stores shut down. And I mean, the, the theaters closed. And they said men would lower their, their breath, under the breath to cuss out in public. There was a time in this country when you could go get a loan from the bank and all you had to have collateral say, I'm a member of the Methodist Church. 
Try that now. Go to the bank now and say, I'm going to borrow $50,000. Well, what's your collateral, sir? I'm a Methodist. Well, they'd laugh you out of there. Get out of here, man. Uh, 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 or a Baptist either, for that matter. But that's how much respect people had for the church and the ministry during those days. Now, if, if you think nobody should ever shout, and there will be people hear this, I'm sure, no, no emotion, no holler. They, they make fun of us for hollering and screaming. Um, you display a remarkable ignorance of Scripture. I'm going to give you Old Testament Scriptures that sets a New Testament precedence, listen to me, a New Testament precedent for worshiping God aloud. Joshua chapter 6 and verse 5. Don't turn to it. We don't have time. He said, when you hear the sound of the trumpet, what's the sound of a trumpet a picture of? Preaching. Lift up thy voice like a trumpet. Isaiah 58. And show me. He said, when you hear the sound of a trumpet, he said, the people shouted with a great shout. 1 Samuel 4 and verse 5. He said, they shouted with a great shout. And the earth rang from the noise of it, and it said the Philistines heard it and was scared. Them people shouted so loud that the sinners heard it and was scared. Now, I've got a lot to say, so you just listen to me this evening. Second Samuel 6 and verse 15, it said when they brought up the ark of God, they brought that's the presence of the Lord in the Old Testament, it said they brought it up with shouting. Same thing in First Chronicles 15 and verse 28. Psalm 47 verse 1 says, Oh, clap your hands, all ye people. Shout unto God with the voice of triumph. Zephaniah chapter 3 and verse 14 said, Shout, O Israel. Ezra chapter 3 and verse 11 said, It said they praised the Lord and they shouted. Ezra 3 verses 12 and 13 said, They had shouts of joy and it was heard afar off. Man, we had a youth rally in Marion one time. Eh? People didn't even go to church, heard that. We was right downtown and had a tent with 3,000 people in it. But you could hear it a mile away, buddy, loud and clear. I mean, people screaming and shouting and hollering and praising God. Uh, the, uh, the definition of the word preach, the definition of the word preach is to proclaim strongly, to urge sincerely, Urge and proclaim like a four-star general to giving orders to the troops That's, uh, to speak with authority and, 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 and praise the Lord. Isaiah 58 and verse 1. Somebody said, you, you, here's, here's your picture of Jesus. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for they shall see. You know, that ain't the way. Jesus didn't walk around and act like that. Bible said he stood in the temple and cried. He stood in the temple and cried. Now, you want some New Testament? Acts chapter 3 and verse 8 said, they went in there and the lame man got healed. Picture of a man coming to the God physically or picture of a man being saved, being able to walk. And the Bible said that man jumped up and went walking and leaping and praising God. Is that all emotions? I'll tell you why that boy walked and leaped and praised God. God done something for him. I'm going to tell you, if God ever does something for you, Woo! It'll bubble, something will bubble up in your soul. I am not a believer in a bunch of hyped up fake stuff. I don't like to hear a preacher try to whip up a crowd and try to get something out of them. That ain't right. And if there's anything I can't stand, it's a preacher acting like he's crying when he ain't. You ever seen them try to cry, act like they're crying and everybody in there knows he ain't crying? I, that's pitiful. Uh, I mean, if you are crying, hallelujah. Once in a while it, come, it, it comes on me and I can't hold it back. Uh, but don't fake nothing. But I'm telling you, that old boy went walking and leaping and praising God. You say, well, that might offend some big shot. The Phil Philistines heard it and they're scared. Uh, listen, just because there's crazy people out there that carry this thing too far does not mean God don't want you to involve your emotions in worshiping Him. Why did God give you emotions? Why do you even got them? To go to a football game? No, no, no. You don't get, em you don't get emotion to go to a football game. People, listen. Listen to me this evening. I I'll get back to this in just a minute. Everything God gives you the ability to do, art, music, speech, Laughing, crying, or shouting, he give you that ability to praise him with. If you can draw, he give you that ability to do something for him. 
If you can talk good, he give you a good brain. he give you that ability. he give he use it for him. If you've got an IQ, if you're smart, if you're witty, if, you're, if you have a sense of humor, channel it for, God, for the glory of God. They'll criticize me if you're using that word right there, but you know what I'm talking about. Uh, keep, it, keep it in the Word of God and the Spirit of God. Don't, don't become an entertainer. Amen? Amen? Listen, let me talk about preaching here again just a second. God, when He calls a preacher to preach, we're individuals. We're not clones of each other. Every preacher's different. Uh, you got these people on there, they're trying to say, well, a preacher shouldn't, uh, people shouldn't walk around like I do. A preacher shouldn't raise his voice. A preacher shouldn't say this. A preacher shouldn't say that. Danny, the other preacher, they, they, they criticize Brother Townsend down here for uh, having that mountain-style preaching. Listen, the boys from Kentucky, what do you expect them to preach like? Eon Paisley, uh, you know, from, uh, from England and Ireland. Thank God. Listen, listen to me, people. Let's use our head here tonight. God uses preachers. I, I wouldn't expect, if I went to England, to a church, I would not expect the preacher to hack. I would expect it. And he's not going to, or Ireland. They're intellectual. They speak, that's their congregation. That's where their, their culture, and God uses them to do that. Are they of the devil? No. If God's calling them to preach, they ain't of the devil. I've heard guys just talk and stand still and get a lot out of it. And I've seen some just run around and go crazy and it's all hot air. You know what I mean? It lacks substance. It's, it's not... God uses a man's personality. Uh, I believe that there's some messages, a lot of messages, that are only meant for the crowd they're preached to. What I mean by that? Somebody sent me a thing on YouTube where these, these, this perverted guy, I don't even know what his name is, somewhere out west, he's really a perverted guy. And all he does is make fun of Christians. And they'll get, a, they'll get part of a shouting service where it got real good somewhere. And I agree, some of the stuff probably, what God wasn't in it. I agree. But they'll take something like that and say, look at these stupid Christians. Look at these stupid Christians. Why are they they're just mass confusion, crazy bunch of Christians? And I believe a lot of times what goes on in a church ain't none of nobody else's business, and it's that way. You know, I, you know my reason for believing that? Um, Jesus preached the sermon of John 3, we got it. Jesus preached in John 4, we got it. Jesus preached in John 5, we got it. Paul preached in the book of Acts, we got it. But did you know Jesus preached hundreds of sermons that men you don't even, never will hear? Never did hear, nobody else did either, except the people that was there. God chose them to put in the Bible for all of us. There are some messages everybody needs to hear. Can you understand what I'm saying? There are some messages everybody in the world needs to hear, and there's some messages just for a church at a certain time at a certain place. Can you understand that? Now, you see a man jump up and start crying and wave your hand, don't say, well, that stupid fanatic, what's wrong with him? He's all emotional. He might have just had his boy to get saved. His wife might have just come through a terrible surgery and made it, and but he's happy. Why did God give you your emotions? God give me the ability to laugh, do you honestly think I'm supposed to laugh at some wicked TV show or some pervert on earth telling dirty jokes? That ain't why God let us. God let us laugh. Laughter doeth good like a medicine. That's why we got it. It's good for you. It's good for you. And you ever seen these people think it's a sin to laugh at church? There's something wrong with somebody like that. I, I don't know if I trust somebody that has that attitude. They don't think it's sin to sleep. Uh, but I tell you what, brother, they're always talking about how, how terrible it is. Oh, it, now, I understand. Our job is serious. I take my job serious. You don't think I take my job serious? You are greatly, greatly wrong. I, you ain't never seen nobody take this no more serious than I do. Uh, but you can, you, I'm, you, the ability to get mad. We have anger. What does the Bible say? Be you angry and what? Sin not. You're supposed to get mad sometimes. Sometimes the preacher's supposed to be mad when he preaches at the devil, at the, at the sin out there in the world. So if we're to be angry and sin not, we're also to be excited and sin not. You can be excited and do wrong. We're to be happy and sin not. We're to be sad and sin not. Somebody said, well, it's just a bunch of... Are you trying to tell me that if, if, you, if somebody knocked on your door and say you want a sweepstakes and you're going to get a million dollars next week, that you'd say, 
Thank you very much. If I wouldn't, man, I'd jump up and down, clap my hands, say, Woo! Thank you, Jesus. I would. I would. I, I, I'm emotional. I'm emotional. There's nothing wrong with being emotional. Somebody said, well, them revivals, all it is. That ain't all it is. I'm going to tell you something, people. You don't get 3,000 people out 12 weeks in 100 degree weather it's because somebody's emotional. <laughs> I, don't, I don't have... Teenagers on the football team don't sit in church at 1.30 in the morning like they did in Alabama because they're getting emotional. There's a lot more emotion at that football game. And they left it, son, come right over in the house of God and had, they didn't want to leave. Women were sitting out in the parking lot saying, what in the world is going on in there? And, and it was good. Now, I wouldn't expect a preacher in, from the mountains to stand up here and talk like somebody from England. I wouldn't expect him to. Um, uh, every message is not to the same world, uh, to the whole world. Jesus and Paul, a lot of their sermons didn't make it out to the whole world. God uses every man's personality and gifts of the preacher to get his message across to a certain group of people at a certain time. If I were in Haiti tonight preaching, I would not have on long sleeve a shirt. I, I would have on, you, 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 I, Paul said, I'm all things to all men. That don't mean he compromised. That means he understands the audience that he's preaching to. And somehow or another, we got these nuts. I think, I think the preachers who are very critical of the Burlington Revival and others have one or two problems. They're either, they're either ignorant of what real revival is or they're jealous, or perhaps both. And I'd hate to think that, but that's, that's just about guarantee. I had one tell me, he said, I'm just jealous of it. I said, well, at least you're honest, praise God. A amen. Uh, that, you ain't going to get nowhere like that. God ain't going to bless your ministry if you're secretly jealous. If you spend your whole time trying to knock down somebody that is doing it because it makes you feel bad because you ain't doing nothing. I mean, if, if you say, well, well, I'm better than that man is. Why ain't God blessing me? That ain't really God. <laughs> you know, <laughs> obviously it ain't. Uh, uh, listen, that's why the internet is causing so much confusion and dividing churches and preachers getting on there fussing all the time because they get a camp meeting service and they laugh at them and they have no clue what's going on. Let me tell you something, buddy. Was the disciples getting filled with the Holy Ghost real in Acts chapter 2? Yes or no? You know what they said about them? Said that's drunk. Amen? That's what he said. Them people's drunk. They acted like drunks. So I guess the disciples were all just emotionalism and not real. Let me tell you what 2 Samuel 6.21 said. Michael, David's wife. David's wife, when David come back from the battle, he was happy. And David just got emotional. It was all hype. And the Bible said David danced before the Lord with all his might. And you know what? She criticized him. Oh, gosh. You make me sick out there getting in front of those girls dancing like that. And David said, listen, I wasn't dancing for them girls. I was dancing for my Lord for giving me the victory. And you talk about them girls out there, they're going to respect me and honor me. That's better than you do. And God shut her womb up. She never could have no kids. That's a picture of a church that's critical of old-fashioned worshiping God and shouting and praising God. I ain't going to be critical of it. No, sir, buddy. Now, I know there's some nuts. There's always nuts. I know there's hype. There's always hype. I know there's false professions and 50 church members getting saved. It's been saved three times already. I know all that. But I'll tell you one thing, brother. When God does something, it'll last in a person's life, and it's real. Okay? Man said, um, uh, one man said this. He said, uh, well, when I go to church, I don't want to hear a preacher get up and tell a bunch of stories. I just want to hear the Word of God. So you want a guy to get up here and just read the Bible? There is a, some preachers going around the country trying to get, and I'm saying this to help y'all because we have a lot of preachers coming in here in a few weeks. There's preachers saying that a preacher should tell no stories. I think they ain't read their Bible. Listen, when Jesus was here, he told one story right after another. And all he had was the Old Testament. 
The parable of the sower and the seed. The woman, the woman that, that couldn't find the thing. The, the, the woman, the mites, the rich man in hell. The, the, always an illustration, a story, an illustration, a story. It's a proven fact the best way to get a point across is by repetition and illustration. Repetition and illustration. I'll never forget what Deborah Parker said up there in Marion years ago. Deborah had this dry sense of humor. She's really smart. And uh, you've got to be sometimes in this church business because people have you thinking crazy stuff. And that's part of my job is to keep, y'all, keep you level. And uh, uh, they come to Deborah and they said, uh, Deborah said, uh, boy, you've got to go hear this preacher. I said, my goodness, all he does is quote Scripture. And she said, well, I can read the Bible. Now, you know what she meant? She meant that over there in the book of Nehemiah, chapter 8 and verse 8, they preached the word, and it says they caused them to understand the sense. That's what a preacher's job is. My job is not to stand up here and read the Bible to you. My job is to read the Bible and then cause you to understand what it's saying and what God's saying to us. Amen? Can you say amen right there? My job is to take the Scripture and cause you to get the sense. That's Nehemiah chapter 8 and verse 8. And we rightly divide the word of truth. Humor is the vehicle that opens the heart. You know, a bunch of people laugh and cut up and have a good time. Their heart's open. Bam! You stab them with the truth. That's God's purpose in humor. God's purpose in humor is that when young people come in, they have a good time they have, and they let their guard down. Bam! The Word of God goes in their heart. If that's heresy... Make the most of it. Uh, I'm telling you, brother, that you, some people take yourself too serious. Uh, if, if it's your personality, let God use it. Don't try to be somebody else. You can tell when somebody's faking or they're trying to be somebody else. I feel sorry for preachers that get up and you can tell they're faking. Now, I'm telling you something, y'all. I, I know. I can't get up here and teach y'all Greek and Hebrew. I don't know it. Don't want to know it. I'd be faking if I tried to. I know what I can do. I know my lane. I know what I can like, like playing ball, I know what I can do, and I know what I can't do. So I'm going to do what I can and trust God will bless it and use it. All right? If, if all a man do is trying to be a comedian, he ought to just shut up. He, that's jesting and joking and, and uh, foolish talking, as the Bible said. Um, uh, Jesus did quote Scripture, but told many, many, many other stories. Now, there are... There is a strong movement today because of government intervention about church not even being in a church building. They're preaching against church buildings. I say because all the churches in the New Testament meant in a house. We'll study that another time, but um, uh, the New Testament does not tell us or authorize us to have a church building. Neither does it authorize you to have an Internet ministry or air condition or, indoor, or electricity. Electricity is more evil than a building. It's connected with Satan. It's, that's what Jesus said. What about if you have a home, uh, home church and you say, we don't believe in going to a church building and you have this home church and you maybe get a burden and go win your neighbors the Lord and they get saved and their family gets saved and then you've got 20 people showing up in your living room on the whole five. Are you trying to tell me it would be wrong for y'all to get build you a building for them people to meet and have church in? No. There's no word in the Bible. Where do you think they met in Acts? The book of Acts chapter 20 is that they met in, a, in, a, in the upper room in the gospel. It doesn't say that's a house. And it said in Acts 20 they met in the third loft and it don't say that's somebody's house. Like some kind of barn or something. So there's nothing wrong with having a meeting house. We know this is a meeting house. We know this ain't the church. People say, well, you're going to church. is a figure of speech. We know that we go to the building where the church meets. You don't have to be a genius to figure that out. Don't get all hung up on stuff like that and let the devil trick you. There's nothing wrong with having a church building. There is something wrong with worshiping it and making it a shrine and thinking you're more holy when you walk in it. That's wrong. Amen? There ain't nothing wrong with having no building come and worship God. It ain't crazy. That's ridiculous. It's a place. God always had a place in the Old Testament for people to worship Him. Some worship the building. That's wrong. All right? Let's finish this up here. I'm talking fast, so uh, we'll finish it up. Now, what about crying, shedding tears, come to the altar? Uh, in the Old Testament, they come to the altar, they brought a sacrifice, and they come and burnt that sacrifice on the Old Testament altar. They did it right then. That was atonement for their sins. 
Now, that didn't forgive their sin. It covered it till the blood of Jesus came and took it away. So, New Testament speaking, the Bible said we present our bodies a living sacrifice. You don't have to come kneel down here at the altar, but there sure ain't nothing wrong with it. Confessing Christ publicly, that's what they did all throughout the New Testament. They sure ain't nothing wrong. So don't be, don't be deceived and get weird. Years ago, he told me, he said, will you show me some scripture for going to the altar? Yeah, well, will you show me some for having uh, air conditioning, electricity, and a, and a car? No. No, you can't. Um, or, or wearing a tie for that. If, if something's not against scripture, and you can use it for God, then, then it's okay. Um, there's something, nothing wrong with a public profession. All right? Amen. Uh, make sure, make sure, make sure. Uh, uh, they criticized the Burlington Revival and said all it was was singing. Matter of fact, I heard, I've heard two or three people say this years back. They say, well, they said somebody down there, they didn't even have no preaching and somebody got saved. That's impossible. No, it is not impossible. It is not impossible. I've been in a lot of services where they sung the whole time. And nothing in the Bible says you have to sing two songs and let somebody talk for an hour and bore everybody to death. Nothing wrong with that. You say, well, they can't get saved unless they hear the gospel. They heard it yes last night and the night before and from their mama and from the preacher. It don't say you have to hear the gospel that second and then get saved. You do have to hear the gospel. But you, listen, these people heard the gospel all their life. Comes into a church, I got saved. Night I got saved is before the preaching. The night I got saved, don't you tell me I didn't get saved. You're wasting your breath telling me that's emotion, brother. Listen, you don't go through the mess I've been through on emotions that happened when you was 18 years old. God done something for me. I ain't never got over it. Because my mom preached to me my whole life. I heard the word of God. I heard it. Amen. As I said, most preachers are either ignorant or jealous of what went on. Now, I'm not an expert on Berlin Revival. I didn't go once. But I thank God for it. I praise God for everything he done. Did they do everything right? Probably not. Did they call on some people to pray? Probably shouldn't have. Probably shouldn't have. I don't know. Did there, was there some hype? Absolutely. Was there some wildfire? Of course. There always is when God moves. Always. Always, like old Thutis over there in the book of Acts, and in the book of Acts, it's old, they was trying to speak against the disciples one time, and they said, boy, yeah, these men, put them in jail, get rid of them and everything. And old boy jumped up and he said, now wait a minute, y'all. There was an old boy jumped up over here, and they, he drew a crowd after him, and he come to naught. And there was another old boy jumped up over here, and they run after him, and he come to naught. He said, if this work be of men, don't worry about it. Let them alone. It'll come to nothing. But it's of God. You better not fight it, lest happily you be fighting against God. That's what he told them. And they said, you're a smart man. Better live. Is there some stuff goes on to these revivals that ain't of God? You better believe it. Is there stuff that goes on at them dead home churches that ain't of God? You better believe it. Amen. Everybody wants revival, but they want it in their church. A lot of preachers, I preach, I ain't going to that. All it is is a bunch of old country music. Bang, 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 bang. Now, listen, that ain't all it was. Amen? 3,000 people don't sit in 100-degree weather for 12 weeks to listen to country music. Not even the real country music. Nobody does that. I'm telling you people, God done something. I like what old Carl Lackey, guys told him one time, he said, he went and preached a revival and come back and had 50-something people say, the preacher said, now Carl. Do you really believe all 57 of them got saved? He said they probably didn't. Do you believe all two of yours last year got saved? Probably didn't. And that's what it is. It's jealousy. It's jealousy. CT's God's man. God's man. Every preacher's different. He might do stuff I wouldn't do. I might do something. He's God's man. We need to pray for him. Bid him Godspeed. Pray God will put him in overdrive. He's only 30-something years old. Pray God will use him to reach the world for Jesus. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Amen. Uh, and, and, and I'm going to tell you something else. I've been in some revivals. And when you're right in the middle of that thing, people's coming at you with everything. It's, the most thing that, 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 that. it's like being in the middle of a whirlwind, brother, and trying to hold on to God's will and find God's will right in the middle of a big... You don't always make the best decisions every single second. So be careful about being critical. Uh, 
uh, about. Now, if 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 you can get a if you get a, have to get a band going and get a good beat going and get everybody started, before you can get anything, that's all you've got. You ain't got nothing. I've seen God move in, in services and people get under conviction and cry when they wasn't even no music, not even piano. Somebody just stand up and start singing. So just remember what I told you tonight. Amen? And let your senses be exercised to discern both good and evil. Pray for all the converts down there. One sign of a sure revival is, after it's over, that church usually doubles in attendance. And other churches around it do too. I don't know about that. I ain't heard it down there. I don't even know who the home church was. But I guarantee you one thing, business picked up after it's over, after the tent's gone. That's what a real revival is. All right? You can shut, shut me off back there, Andy. Anybody got a question? We'll take just.